Welcome to another episode of Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides, and with me as always is Mr. Chris Hellstrom. How are you today, Chris? Doing great, Jody. Doing great. How about you? I'm doing pretty good, too. Yeah? Yep. Awesome. Yeah. What's been going on with you this morning? Anything? <laughs> it's, 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 we're talking, what, late summer, early fall. I'm playing pickleball as usual because I'm getting ready for a tournament in Vegas. So. All right. Well, very good. Very yeah. good for you. What are we talking about today? Music theory and how yeah. you as a producer or, and well, I really guess that wouldn't be an engineer's gig, but a producer's gig of being able to apply your knowledge of it to help an artist when you are producing them, should they need it and they be ignorant. Is that about right? That was actually quite a word salad coming from you. I'm not used to that. <laughs> yeah, in, in how we can communicate with artists. And if we are an artist, how this is beneficial to us as well. We mentioned in a joking fashion with our, in our talk with Mike Green from Realitone, and we brought up something where Tommy Tedesco would do this and that with changing chords around and throwing around some modal names and things. So it occurred to us that we might want to talk a little bit about this so that that's something that actually means something to people. Sure. We're talking uh, about music to artists and for ourselves. So the first thing I tend to say to people when I'm teaching and I'm starting to talk about music theory. Don't that, do it! <laughs> <laughs> is to not be afraid of it. I think some people have the misunderstanding that music theory is a set of rules. It is. They came down on stone tablets. Don't you know that? Yeah, from the Beatles, I think, as well. This is how it has to be done. Sure. No, it, it's really just knowing terminology. It's not a set of rules. It's just a way to express musical ideas with other people in a meaningful way so that people know what you're actually talking about, or even if it's like... I don't know what you charts. just said. <laughs> you lie. You know exactly what I said. Yeah, I think I would liken it a little bit different than that. In okay. My comparison would be it's akin to being able to speak your native tongue you can learn it without knowing what the letters and the alphabet and sentence structure and all that is. And music is the same way. You can play an instrument without knowing theory, but theory is essentially the bits and pieces that become the building blocks of, as you say, communication, the letters, the words, and the sentence structure to me. You know? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Although my wife would joke that I'm slowly learning how to unspeak both my languages, <laughs> Swedish and English. So um, I would absolutely agree with that. I think it's just a way of being able to explain a sound and associating a sound to that. So knowing, well, if I'm trying to create a certain emotion, mm -hmm. to know where where can I get that kind of Beatles-y kind of a thing? Okay, well, maybe... I'll go to the Beatles. You, <laughs> yeah, but is it, you know, are you... No, I'm I'm going from a major four chord to a minor four chord back to one, that type of a thing. Mm -hmm. that, and it's like, yeah, that's that sound. So it's one of those things that allows us to communicate with other musicians how to get a point across as opposed to having to sit by an instrument and going, okay, see these keys right here on the piano, press down those, or on the guitar, play the chord right here, you know, mm -hmm. that communication gets a heck of a lot easier. In thinking about that, yeah, how much music theory do you think you should know? I think it depends on your role or what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think – knowing a lot in music theory, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing unless you get so consumed by it that you get paralysis when you're writing something. Mm. Or you're thinking, oh, I have to do this because this would be a modal interchange or whatever it is. Right. But I think it depends on your role. If you are – let's say that you're a producer right, and you're involved – in the writing process, or certainly the arranging process with a band. It this is a allow... modern definition to a producer, by the way, because there used to be songwriters that wrote for the bands, and there still are some of those, but 
the idea of someone who's strictly an arranger is a dying breed. Yeah. Now we're going off on a little bit of a sidestep here, but that's okay. But I want to follow through on that. Mm -hmm. The arranger, because I think today a new type of arranger is somebody that might come in, oh, I'm a vocal arranger. Mm -hmm. You know, where they come in and they work with strictly like backing vocals or they're stacking harmonies or maybe they're just the one running the uh, Melodyne rig. I don't know. Well, but that's <laughs> not know? really arranging. That's editing and being a Right, but, but it's all of that. So I think that's another one of those words that changes. Let's go back to that producer thing. When yep. you're involved with writing, you can perhaps suggest chord changes if something isn't working. If you have a standard chord progression, we might go, oh, maybe we substitute that chord or make that a major chord instead of a minor chord, whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. Try a sus thing. Something like that where you can express musical ideas. That, of course, means that the artists that you're talking to have to know what the hell you're talking about as well, right? But then that's not your problem as a producer in that case, I guess. Sure it is. Apparently, if you know more than they do, you have to sugarcoat it and be able to give it to them in a way they'll understand. Indeed. Absolutely. What's your take on it, though? I mean, I'm assuming you kind of feel the same way, but what's your angle? If you'd have asked me that question 20 years ago, yeah, I would have said, you have to know music theory. Me too. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that answer anymore. However, is it useful? You're damn right it is. Especially in a writing situation where you're just writing for the freedom of writing and you get stuck somewhere. Theory is awesome in giving you a roadmap or a topographical map of ways to get out of the situation that you're in to make something cool would be my thinking on it. Can people do cool stuff without it? Sure. There's tons of bands out there that have been huge successes without any music theory. Does it matter? Maybe, maybe not. If you want a career, it certainly helps. If you want to roll the luck of the dice, then don't learn it. Yeah, I think you said a lot of really good things there. First one being, do you absolutely have to know it? In today's landscape, no, you don't, but it's not going to hurt you either. Uh -uh. The second thing that you brought up there, there's a lot of great people that have made careers out of this that don't know this. And I think sometimes it's easy for people to conflate that with, okay, well, then I don't need to know it either, uh -huh. you know? And people, well, Jimi Hendrix didn't know any theory. I'm like, okay, well, first of all, how do you know that? But second of all, you're not Jimi Hendrix. You know? <laughs> so Go light you, your guitar on fire, then we'll talk. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, it's you have to let the talent be able to speak in that way, right? If you don't know this stuff and you can produce quality stuff, then awesome. That's working for you. I would argue that knowing a little bit more about what it is that you're doing is probably not going to hurt you either mm -hmm. because that's already inside of you. You're a big fan of Steve Lukather. I am, yeah. How much theory do you think he knows? An insane amount. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, because I know I, he, I know. I get it. I mean, he studied jazz and bebop players and studied with those kind of teachers when he was, you know, coming up, right? Right. But that's another angle, right? If you're, if we think of Steve Lukather as the session guy, mm -hmm. You know, you come in and you're given charts and stuff to sight read lines on the spot. You have to know this kind of stuff. And if it's like, okay, play over this chord progression, you know, you're not going to have a guy there to show, okay, well, here's your A minor over here. And then when you get up to <laughs> F, you know, next, you know what right. I mean? Well, so even guys like him and also Zach Wilde, he went to music school. He has yeah. lessons. He knows what he's doing when it comes to theory and those kinds of things. You're going to find guys in any genre. It doesn't matter if they're guitar players or if they're just straight up musicians. You're going to find a lot of them that actually know a good amount of what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. During certain times, I think people really overstated the importance of music theory. Let's take, we're, we're talking guitar players now. So let, let's expand on that. Uh -huh. When Ingve Malmsteen blew up, uh -huh. right? It was a lot of talk about well, what makes that tick? You know what what's going on here? And we heard ideas like well, there's a lot of like diminished seven things going on and harmonic minor on the five chord, that kind of thing, right? So people were 
really hungry for that kind of knowledge. But then the grunge thing happened, and it was sort of like the antithesis to that. It was like, no, it's just pure emotion and all this kind of stuff. And I think it became really hip to say that you really don't know what you're doing. (laughs) But I think that was just like a blowback to how it was kind of overstated. But in the same breath, I think overstating how little you know was just kind of like a hipness factor as well. Right. Well, let's get back on track here because you were talking about being it as a producer and getting involved in the writing process. And as an example, I was producing an artist. She had a really, a, a quite amazing song. However, getting into the studio and recording it took a little bit of finagling is a good way of saying it. The song, once it was recorded, didn't really have the same spark that it needed in a certain section. She wasn't heavily schooled on music theory. I offered up a suggestion to change one chord going from one section to another into the chorus. At first, she wasn't super excited by the change, but we recorded the change and ended up putting it into the song. And then she played it around for a few people and everybody loved what it did because it lifted it in a different way and changed it from being monotonous and repetitive into something that had, wait, what, 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 Hey, that was cool (laughs) kind of thing. And generally speaking to me in my thought process of producing and getting something going, it's a much nicer concept when it just get somebody to turn like the RCA Victor dog on the side of their head, so to speak, and be like, Hey, what was that kind of thing? Yeah. So as a producer, it helps to know theory and what the key and the progression of the song is in case something like that comes up in your workflow. Will all artists accept that? Maybe, maybe not. Did I ask for songwriting credit for doing it? No. Should I? Maybe. But it wasn't the arrangement that I was looking at stealing something from the artist. I just wanted it to be better. And that's, I think that it's most useful, right, to get more out of a song or an idea where it's really easy that when we write, we get stuck in certain keys and things that just feel good to us. Without necessarily trying to, we can end up repeating ourselves Mm -hmm. and doing things. And let's face it, there's still only 12 notes in the Western Hemisphere, right, that we're playing with. (laughs) So it it can be hard to do something new and unique. But that's where it comes in. We're like, maybe it's as simple as maybe not even changing the chord itself, but maybe having a different inversion going, thereby allowing the bass line to do something slightly different sure. to to just add a little bit of a twist and like in your case you you bring the song to a new level mm-hmm. and know, just for that, those who don't know an inversion as chris just spoke is the stacking of the arrangement of notes if you have the root of the chord on the bottom that is what they call root position if you're using the third of the chord on the bottom that is a first inversion if you're using the fifth on the bottom that is called a second inversion if you're using the seventh on a bottom it's called a third inversion that's a real quick theory lesson for you right there and with that we're gonna take a word from our sponsors so they show us something new and possibly inverted And we're back. What are we moving on to with, Chris? Something we kind of hinted at, but arrangers. Do they need to know theory? Hell yes, they do. Good luck (laughs) doing your job without knowing that. Hell to the yeah, baby. Yeah. If you're in charge of arranging, let's go with perhaps like a little bit more of a modern take on the arranger thing. Okay. Right? Let's say that you're the vocal arranger. Throw it down. You better know how harmonization of things work, how to create chords so that you play or arrange the the proper notes for them to sing. So it's going to sound pleasing, right? Well, it also helps to know what the actual chord progression is too. Well, yeah, that, yes, that's a huge (laughs) understatement right there. But let's say that you are, you creating a backing vocal part and you have a certain, let's say that it's just a major chord. It's a C major chord. Mm-hmm. C-E-G, and, for those who don't know. Yeah. If you're not as fast as Jody at blurting that out, that would, be, <laughs> <laughs> that would be something you need to know. But if this vocal arranger, it's just trying to create a big harmony over this chord, 
you need to know that those are the three notes in the chord, right? And do you want to add B to that, to add a major seven? What are you going to do? But you need to know that that's what's going to create the sound of that, right? And then knowing that if we're playing in the key of C, these are the notes that you have to deal with, right? So if you're creating more of a moving line, you need to know that that are going to sound pleasing and not too jarring to the listener. Right? Yeah, the same applies not only to the vocal thing that you're talking about, to string arrangements and all kinds of things. As an arranger, you are arranging the instruments and the notes they play. So you damn well better know what theory is. Right. And if you are sort of stepping outside of the norm of what would do that, that's cool if you can make it work. But Experience will tell you that as opposed to just having static harmony moving around when nothing is really going on. It might sound weird, but is it a cool weird? Is that what you're going for? If you're doing like a traditional pop track, you're doing like a soulful R&B, you might not want to get too crazy with the vocal arrangement so that now you're you're creating something that would fit on Frank Zappa's Jazz from Hell type of thing, right? Because <laughs> there's some dense harmony going on there, right? Yeah. He always yeah. had dense things going on, though. Yeah. The vast because, majority of the time because he was crazy good at all that shit. Right. And he could explain all of this to you as well, so and why it's important. So Do you have any examples of, of working with a vocalist where they didn't know what the hell they were doing and trying to sing harmonizing lines and you have to kind of pull them out of their headspace and realign what they're doing? I wouldn't say necessarily that they didn't know what they were doing, but there have been certain sessions where instead of – having just a sort of like what we'd like to call in Sweden, like a hockey choir where everybody's just kind of yelling, kind of like an ACDC type of a thing in the background. Well, that's Maybe, a gang vocal. That's not a harmonizing. No, exactly. But I'm saying instead of doing something like that, maybe have them try to sing the third or the fifth or something. So it's been one of those suggestions kind of thing that I've come across. Other times, I guess I've been fortunate with vocalists that they – they kind of have an idea what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, not any real horror stories, but it's nice when you don't have those. So, <laughs> but what about you? Here's a real world example. Another artist I'm producing at a given point to, earlier this year comes in, working on the song, decides they want to sing harmony lines. It's like, all right, great, let's do it. They sing parallel harmony to the main line. Right. It's not often that that's really going to work. Right. And in this case, in this particular song, it was like, that just sounds wrong. But I didn't say it that way. I offered up suggestions and said, hey, let's try to sing what you're doing like this. And I pounded out the notes based on the chord progression instead. And mm -hmm. at first they had a little trouble. So I had to write it in, so to speak, with the piano so they could sing to it and then give them a little time to sing to it and then stack that with a couple of other harmony lines that would match that with the chord progression. They got done. They were unsure about it at first. And then the bass player came in and did their thing. And they were like, oh, man, the chords and the way you're singing over them with the harmonies is so cool. And the artist just said, that was Jody's doing... <laughs> Well, that and it's was not, very nice. That was of the not artist. what I was going for, but at the same time, they were willing to admit that they didn't even get it. So it's you didn't just go, things. no, let, let, let's not do it your way. Let's do it good. No. No, uh, I did not say it that way. <laughs> if you do it that way, you're probably going to piss off the artist and then everything's going to go and not be a fun work environment. Yeah. So. And then you're going to get a reputation for doing that and you'll never work again. Maybe. Right. So what about as a musician, though? Because you, you talked about artists here coming in. And as an artist, I mm -hmm. know what I think. I think I know what you think. But I'm going to ask you anyway. Should you know all this stuff as an artist? Again, similar answers to something earlier. If you'd asked sure. me 20 years ago, I would have said, hell to the yeah, you got to know your shit. 20 years later, I still feel like, hell to the yeah, you should know your shit, but do you really? No. Where I think it becomes a real benefit, in the same way it could be a real crutch. And mind you, I think about theory substantially different from most people. In fact, pretty much from just about everybody. And I think we've explained it a little bit in the past on the podcast of how I think about it. But 
I know from songwriting experience with other people and sometimes with my own material that I've written, there are moments where it can feel like you've painted yourself into a corner and your brain is no longer functioning in a capacity that says, I know how to get out of this and get to the next section or make something cool happen here. And this is where having theory can be a real bonus because now you can take whatever's happening in front of where you're having the trouble, figure out theoretically what it is you're doing to give yourself some sort of guideline, roadmap, topographical map, bar graph, however you want to look at it, of possibilities to help spark the creative process and amp it up and and get things rolling. By the same token, I know plenty of guys that know theory inside and out, but they use it as a crutch and they get stuck with not necessarily being creative and the shit gets boring. It really comes down to having a tool chest knowing your tools, making good use of those tools, but not relying on the tools 100% of the time. Because in music, unfortunately, I don't think it works very well to be super reliant on it 100% of the time. That's my feeling of it. Yeah, I think that's very valid. I think it's, again, that having something in your tool chest to get you out of a pickle, shall we say. Sticky situations, a sticky wicket. Yeah. But again, what it's important to remember here, I think, is we're talking about this in theoretical terms. But what it really means is that music is really nothing more than tension and release. Mm-hmm. That, that's kind of what we're, we're pushing our ears to hear a certain sound. And when we have a little bit of theoretical knowledge, we're using a different type of sound that we know, okay, this is going to sound like this, and that's going to point our ears to a different direction. However you're doing that with other dominant chords or secondary dominance or whatever kind of chord trick that you're doing. Ooh, now you're going chord. down a rabbit hole. See, secondary dominance. Like, <laughs> but it's these things that, that can help us point our ear towards a different sound and mm-hmm. thereby we can kind of tilt in the songwriting. I think those are important parts to have in our tool chest. Now, one thing that I wanted to bring up as well In today, when we're working with music production, there's a lot of people that rely on loops and sample-based things, like whether you're using like services when you're subscribing to different lines or pre-made shit. There you go. Although maybe it's not necessarily shit. Sorry. Yeah, pre-made stuff. Stuff. How about that? Yeah. Having to know a lot of stuff is perhaps taken out of the equation for you, and you're not really making those decisions because you might have said, well, I'm using stuff in this key and it would just sort of transpose things for you. While that works, I think you're doing a little bit of a disservice to yourself because you're purposely almost shielding yourself from from learning something. that Willful ignorance? Yeah, I didn't want to say that, but that that's basically it, right? And (laughs) I've seen on music forums and things, and this is something that, drives me absolutely crazy. Uh Uh-oh, here comes the soapbox. (laughs) It's the soapbox, but it also, I guess it could be old man yelling at cloud, right? Where people are asking, is there a plugin that can tell me what chord I'm playing? Or is it a plugin that can suggest melodies for the chord I'm playing? I don't know. I'm just thinking... If there's a plug-in for it, but I do know that the DAW that I know of uh, does it, and I'm sure a lot of DAWs will do it. Logic will do it. They'll tell you what chord you're playing. Yeah, If but you're it doing it tell in MIDI, that, yeah, it won't tell you. Right. Video, but, yeah. but as a musician, that's your job. Isn't that? That's your function, right? That's the way I'm seeing it. I know that might make me sound really old-fashioned, but that's where I think just having a little bit of knowledge will help you along the way. However, I digress. I'm going to move on to a different point here, okay? Okay. You said about people that know a lot of theory that they can write the same stuff and be very predictable. Mm -hmm. I was immediately reminded when you said that of an artist that I – sometimes do some sessions for. I record guitar for this guy. Okay. And here's a person that his day job, he's a composer. He writes for film and TV. 
Good for him. Because of that, he's sort of coming from the scoring world. Mm -hmm. He's a lot less bound to all these. So when he's writing more like pop or rock stuff, sometimes I'm like, how do you write this? This is this is crazy because he comes up with all these chord changes that I would not in a million years do. But it works for him. And it gives obviously a different sound with what we normally would think. But it's also really, really cool. There is one of those things where you can know all about this stuff, but you don't have to be shackled by it. Right. So the one, four, and the five chord don't need to have the same quality if you're playing in whatever key, right? You can break out of that. Again, a little bit of music knowledge goes a long way. Well, it could also, a little bit of music knowledge or music theory, that is, when you don't know very much can be stupid dangerous. If you take it as a rule, yeah. right? well, it's like, yeah, no, it's supposed to be this. Is it? You know, why? <laughs> you know, nope doesn't. What do you think we should know when it comes to as sort of like a bare minimum if we're wearing some of these hats, where we're a, at least a musician or, or a producer, where somebody might say, hey, Jody, I just sit and I'm making beats. I work with primary like pre-made loops, that type of thing. What should I know that would help me? The answer I'd give if you're just doing that, if it sounds good, it is good. Yeah. <laughs> However. <laughs> However, you know. if you want to be real with what you want to know, you need to know the idea of what a scale is, how to build a particular scale. You need to know what a major chord is. You need to know what a minor chord is. Everything builds off of those two things anyway. Yeah. In terms of the building blocks to music. Once you know that, you need to know how to harmonize a scale. And you need to know how to harmonize based off a chord, too, because harmonizing a scale is not the same as harmonizing a chord per se. I would agree with that as well. And I would say that when it comes to harmonizing a scale, well, first of all, maybe if somebody that doesn't know what that is, it's like, let's say that you have a major scale that has seven notes in it. The major scale has seven notes in it. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Each one of those notes will have a chord associated with it that it's in that key. That is called harmonizing a scale. So they all come from the same scale. That's the same with minors as well. Now, I don't think it's necessarily to have a watertight knowledge of how to harmonize the melodic minor scale, for example. Well, that's that hard chord. to harmonize in some spots, but yes. Yeah, but it, it's one of those things that where you probably find, unless you're doing a lot of jazz stuff, mm -hmm. you might not need to know all that kind of stuff. But certainly spotting key centers and know what key that we're in. Oh, we're in, we're playing in D flat minor. We need to know that so that we can make educated decisions based around that. I'll agree with that. All right, there we go. So I guess we kind of go out on a, eh. A little bit of a whimper here. <laughs> well, it's not so much a whimper. I... So on that note, anything else that you want to add to that? that no, because then it's, it becomes it's a, good a master idea to class know a little on bit theory, and we don't need to get into a master class level about it. We just feel that it's a good idea for the producer or the arranger to know a decent amount of theory in case the artist gets stuck. And as an artist, it's a really good idea to know a decent amount of theory in case you get stuck. But as yeah. a mix engineer, and that's all you're doing, you probably don't really need to know that much theory. No, oh, then you're better off knowing, you know, frequencies and how to use a compressor, that type of thing. Right. right. So, However, yeah. if you are an engineer who is working on vocal harmonies using auto-tune or melodyne or repitch, whatever it is that helps you to arrange vocals and tune the instrument of the vocal or other instruments, you probably need to know what the intended note was if you're changing it from wherever it was slightly out of tune from. There you go. Yes. And with that, we're going to move on to our Friday Finds. Chris, what have you got today? Have I told you before that I uh, like Heaviosity? I believe the listeners know this by now, if unless they're brand spanking new. Okay. Well, 
Heavy City just came out with Mosaic Paths. Didn't they come they out with this, something last week too and the week before? I mean, it's they just always like come out with cool stuff, man. This week they came out with something called Mosaic Paths, and it's you know it has that mosaic engine which can do all the rhythmic and swirly things, and it's Heavy City, man. So that's all I can really say about that. So I have to pick that for my Friday find, Mosaic Paths. However, I do have another mention that I really want to do. Oh, wow. Chris has got two this week. I got two this week because you got two last week. And the week before, I think. (laughs) And the week before. So you owe me one. There you go. I discovered a company from Czechia. Wow. That's called Mixtable. They make custom desks and they make custom racks. And what I thought was really cool that really caught my eye was that they make these custom enclosures for control surfaces. Mm. So I saw them have them for like the SSL ones. I think they make them for the fader ports. Pretty much anything that you want because they're custom made. Right. They're so custom made that they don't even announce any prices on their website. So that probably tells you (laughs) that these are not probably budget cases, but they look freaking amazing. So, you know, Second notice to uh, Mixtable. Go check them out at like Mixtable.com. they got really, really cool stuff. And with that said, what about you, Jody? What do you got for us? I'm going to go out on a limb and tell people that are in the digital performer camp, if you have not heard word as of this morning's podcast when this was recorded, digital performer has got a new version called 11.2, and it includes... ARA to support. Whee! They join the likes of Studio One and Logic Pro and allow you to use plugins that have ARA capability, which would include Melodyne, Vocaline, Repitch, even some Isotope stuff does ARA. So if you're a digital performer user, You probably want to get this update because ARA is the way we'd like to go. Which is pretty handy when you're doing vocal harmonization and arranging. That's right. Knowing your theory stuff right there. Hopefully Luna will join that bandwagon soon because, you know, they just barely got on the side chain thing last week. (laughs) Well, hopefully, right? But there's still a version one, right? So technically. Something like that, yes. Anyway, while we've got your attention, we ask that you go to InsideTheRecordingStudio.com and sign up for our mailing list. Doing so gets you weekly reminders about the Tuesday tips when they come out, and we'll make sure you don't miss any future episodes of this lovely podcast. Send us an email at goldstargeo. O-L-D-S-T-A-R at InsideTheRecordingStudio.com with the phrase music theory, and you'll get something cool back in your inbox. If you have a topic or suggestion for Chris and I to explain in a future episode, contact us at the contact page, and we'll put it into consideration for a future episode. And with that, I'll say see you next week. See you later, Jody. Thanks for listening, everybody.